Welcome everyone. A reminder, please wear masks. Uh, we're following all the county protocols and think of it this way. Uh, we're Rotarians, the four-way test is up behind me. I'm gonna read the four-way test briefly in the context of thinking about wearing masks. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Particularly the last one, will it be beneficial to all concerned? I'm like the rest of you, I don't, I hate wearing masks and I probably do it less than most, but, but please respect the fact that some people are extremely fastidious about the masks and unless you're eating or drinking, please, please wear your mask when you're uh, at Rotary or at Rotary functions for that matter. Uh, just a reminder, if any of you are on Zoom in the room, mute your speaker and mic. And if you're on Zoom at home or in your office, please mute your microphone. Again, mute your microphone if you're on Zoom at home and use the chat for questions. We will do our best to uh, ask your questions to our, our speaker. speaker. Speakers will stay an extra 15 minutes again this week as we did last week. So just a reminder, when the meeting's over, if you want to leave, of course you can, but just do so quietly. And those of you who want to stay, you could even move up toward the front of the room if you want to ask questions using the mic at the center. A thanks to the Red Badge Committee for being in the greeting line today. So thank you and welcome Red Badgers. And uh, now we'd li I'd like to do guest introductions. If you've got a guest, please come to the microphone, which is no longer there. <laughs> so let's wait on that for a moment. What do you say? We have decided the board at a meeting yesterday decided that with a $2,500 discretionary fund that the board has to spend any way it chooses to donate $1,000 to Haitian relief. Uh, I know that uh, all of you have been feeling the pain of these people in Haiti. There, uh, there is a Rotary Club in Florida that's acting as a clearinghouse, but Liz Monley, who is our disaster relief chair, she'll make the decision how to do that, but I just wanted to let you all know and I would encourage all of you, if you haven't done so, to consider donating some money to Haiti. Uh, talk about a double or a triple whammy for a society that the, it was already the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And then to have uh, earthquake storms and everything else has been really, really sad. So let's welcome guests. Anybody have a guest today? Please come up to the microphone. How you doing, Tim? Good afternoon, President Steve. Hey Tim, may I interrupt you? I wanted to remember, remind everyone, when you come up to that microphone, feel free to take it out of the cradle and hold it about maybe eight inches from your mouth so that we can come as close as possible to having the mic work perfectly. So Tim, go right ahead. Uh, I want, um, my classification is personal injury attorney and I have a guest, Chris Metzger, who is a uh, civil engineer. Chris Metzger. Hi, Chris. And the rest of you, the guests, please come up to the microphone so that we can all see who you are. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, President Steve. Uh, Mike Bohr, uh, classification, uh, business and consumer marketing. And I have brought my returning champion from last week, uh, Mike Anning, who is the owner of Mosaic Mortgage Group, uh, downtown resident, native to San Jose, and actually uh, grew up uh, near Japantown. So. Welcome, Mike Anning. And Mike, Mike Anning and Mike Bohr. Next time Mike Anning comes, remind me again, and I'll, I'll show the pictures that are only between the three of us right now. John Kennett. President Steve, I actually sat down at a table with five of your guests. So I'd like to point out that we have five students from San Jose State that are starting class tomorrow, and they're guests of President Steve. Wonderful. Welcome, students. Thanks for coming. Anyone else? That was too simple. A reminder also to all of you who are part of the program, when you come up to use the mic here, just look at how far away I am from the mic, which is about 10 inches, and try to emulate that, which will make the job of the sound people much easier if we give them a consistent voice and distance from the mic. So be thinking about that throughout the whole year, if you would, rather than going like this or stepping back like this. So just try to try to emulate what, what I do, even though I wouldn't in general.
<laughs> have you ever had 90 people have the same thought before? <laughs> Yoder. Greg Yoder, my friends. <laughs> there you go. Well, first of all, uh, since you haven't introduced him yet, I'm also at a table with four. Sandwiches. Greg, grab that mic and eat it a bit, would you? All right, eat it a bit. Sorry, not about completely, that. but somewhat. I was listening to everything you said. I Thank just wasn't brother. paying attention. So, in any event, we have four guests from San Jose State who are here. Guests of yours and Carl Salas. And I was actually thinking about Carl and you last night. And when Carl made the challenge a while back about you know putting your name in for governor, and I was really frustrated that that didn't happen. And then I got a note from one of my buddies at USC saying you know what, you can write in a candidate. So that's what I did last night. I filled out, you got to do two things. First, you have to, to do a write-in. You actually have to say, I want to recall Gavin Newsom. And then number two, you need to write in Steve Borkenhagen. So he's a special guy. He's got to vote. Thank you, Greg. All right. Cool. Do. You can vote for, you can vote to not recall him and vote for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Greg, we, we, we learn something every day. So if you're moved to do so, write in Steve Borkenhagen for governor. You never, you never know. You just, you never know. After the previous uh, moment, though, I'm guessing nobody's really that interested in me being governor. Uh, and we have a new member to be introduced. Uh, Tom Bondi, you want to come up? And Rich Angeloni, come on up. Up here. I get my uh, 30 seconds of fame, maybe 15 seconds. Uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce Richard Looney to our club as a new member. He's been here now for a number of months. Uh, and um, uh, the head of our executive director at JW House, where I was coerced to go on the board a couple of years ago. And so without further ado, our newest member here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Well, you have indeed made me feel very special. Um, so someone who's got teenagers and kids in their 20s, I don't get that kind of respect at home usually. So. <laughs> I'm not going to do a Rodney Dangerfield, I promise. Um, but Steve asked me to introduce myself to the group, and he said, don't just get up there and read your resume. So I found a better way to bore you. Um, so I'll give you the early years. I grew up in Detroit. When I was 14, my family moved out here for whatever reason. And I got here and it was really kind of a letdown, you know? Lived in Cambrian Park. The houses all looked the same. Didn't have the richness, the diversity, the culture that we had in Detroit. And I was like, what am I doing here? And then we couldn't see the ocean. I grew up watching Gordie Howe. We didn't even have a hockey team. You know, the houses all looked the same. I mean, this just seemed like a big letdown. So. Most days I rode the bus from our home in Cambrian Park, our boring home in Cambrian Park to Bellarmine. And we would go down, the bus would go down Lincoln Avenue and then down Second Street. And I started getting off the bus downtown and exploring a little bit. Um, there was this magnet called Notre Dame High School that might've pulled me off the bus a few times. But I spent a lot of time downtown when I was like 14, 15, 16, just exploring. Um, the first job I had was at the bicycle shop on East William Street, uh, several owners ago, but it's still a bike shop between third and fourth. You know, I discovered my own version of San Jose to fall in love with. With all of its pimples and warts, I love downtown. For whatever reason, this was the part of San Jose where I felt at home. Um, so my home life was, you know, I'm the youngest of seven kids. My parents were activists. There was always newspapers on the kitchen table. We had political discussions at every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My mom was always protesting something, writing a letter to the editor, or inviting a kid to stay with us who didn't have a family. My dad, on the other hand, made his living as a butcher, but he was a voracious fundraiser. He always had these envelopes in his pocket, 
and he was always raising money for something, usually the church, but something. So for me, being a nonprofit executive, fundraising is a natural. It's, it feels like the family business. As executive director of JW House, we are a small organization in Santa Clara. We provide housing and supportive services to families in a medical crisis. So I get to spend most of my days raising money. I have a great team. But really, the thing that I love about it and about the work is just teaching people to give. Like that generosity is the best drug. I have uh, continued this love affair with downtown, lived and or worked down here for most of my life. Uh, we've been in Nagley Park in our current home for almost 22 years. I have a wife, I have kids, they're at school all over the place. My wife works at um, Stanford University. I guess it's where kids who couldn't get into San Jose State frequently go there. <laughs> so last week, my son Adam and I were in Chicago and actually, we were up in Evanston, and we got stuck in a rainstorm. You know those Midwestern things where it's like a beautiful sunny day, and then bam, it starts pouring. So we were running for cover, and the first shelter we found was a loading dock on the side of a building. So we ran in there, and then I started looking around, and then I texted Steve, President Steve, wherever you are. It was the headquarters of Rotary International. That's where we found shelter, under their loading dock. So I will just say, what better welcome to this club than providing shelter in a Chicago rainstorm? Thank you. One story Rich did not mention, I, I met him 30 years ago or more. He had a little restaurant on uh, San Carlos between second and third called Metro Cafe. And Rich was one of the smart ones. He went, he went broke really quickly, like two years. It took me about 40. So Rich, uh, you're, you're, the, you're the smart one. Uh, could Pat Hegens and Ellie Sode come up please? Pat and LA are part of our, what we're calling the COVID cohort. So they joined during COVID. They really never got to properly introduce themselves to all of you. So they're going to give us a brief introduction today. And first will be Pat. And Pat's uh, uncle, uncles and aunts grew up about 100 yards from where I grew up. So when I saw her name, Tejans, which is a pretty strange name, I, I knew she had to be connected. So it's kind of a, a cute completion of the circle, Pat. Thank you, President Steve. And my uncle says hello. Um, nice to see all of you. This is my first time back um, since the before times. And it's a little bit strange, to be honest. Um, my name is Pat Tejans. I'm a native San Josean. Um, left when I was 18. And I was just uh, telling the, my friends at the table, came back at 38. So I was gone for 20 years. So I'm kind of rediscovering San Jose and uh, really enjoyed um, you know, hearing about other people's experience coming to San Jose. So, my wife, Michelle, and I, we have a small company called Run Connection. And in the before times, we were connecting resources between the US and China. And we also have one of the old time historic mansions on the Alameda, um, right there at the Alameda and Randall. So, we do business and cultural events, again, in the before times. Uh, so, it's been, you know, kind of interesting during COVID, just sort of figuring out how to stay connected. And I'm almost out of time, but um, but we we started a nonprofit called the Society of Hearts Delight um, that helps to connect the uh, Chinese immigrant um, professional community um, to local life and culture and sort of more diverse perspectives, especially with the anti-Asian backlash. I lived in China almost seven years. I speak Mandarin Chinese. That's where I met Michelle. So uh, we are learning how to reconnect and uh, how to be together again. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know all of you more. Thank you. And uh, Ele Zode, how'd I do, Ele? Ele Avi Zode, close. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ele Avi Zode. I'm a, let's see, I didn't prepare anything. I'm a native of Lebanon. I came to the US at 15, didn't speak a word of English, 
ended up at Berkeley for graduate school and et cetera in uh, civil engineering and transportation. Uh, I live in San Francisco, but my office is a couple of blocks away from here. Yeah, I joined uh, and then a couple of weeks afterwards, the shutdown happened. So really my introduction was online and, uh, and everything since then has been online. This is my first time back. So I'm looking forward to uh, starting to get back in person to, you know, to the Summit Center and getting to meet every, many of you. And uh, I'd like to thank the amazing recruiting machine right there, Mr. Rod Duradon, for recruiting me into the club and looking forward to a lot of productive years ahead. <laughs> Where it began, I can't begin to know it, but then I know it's growing strong. It was in the spring, and spring became the summer, who believed we'd come along. Touching hands, reaching out, touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline. Good times never seem so good. I've been inclined to believe they never would, but now I look at the night and it don't seem so lonely. We fill it up with only two. I heard her off my shoulders. How can I hurt when holding you? Warm, touching warm, reaching out, touching me. Touching you, sweet Caroline. Good times never seem so good. Been inclined to believe they never would. Oh no, no. Sweet Caroline, good times never seem so good. I've been inclined. To believe they never would, sweet Caroline. Friends, my name is Jeffrey Benson. I'm the director of choirs at San Jose State University. Um, thanks for letting us come and surprise you today. Hopefully we surprised most of you, except for not Caroline. <laughs> Uh, and uh, say a special thanks to President Steve and to Carl for inviting us today. These eight folks are all members of the San Jose State University Coraliers, and um, our classes don't start till tomorrow, but they came in to kind of have a quick rehearsal yesterday um, just for you all. So they're, they're really dedicated.
Uh, the first thing you just heard is Ian Harris. Ian is a junior. Is that right, Ian? Yeah, Ian's a junior in music education at San Jose State. And uh, I, I'll give a shout out. I, most of you don't know this. I just, I didn't even recognize him, but our, our fantastic associate dean from the College of Humanities and the Arts, Jason Alexander. Dean Alexander, thank you for being here. I, I didn't know you were a member. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. We had, we do have a little encore for you. This is a, a, a barbershop arrangement of an old standard that I think originally was maybe made famous by Nat King Cole. This is Orange Colored Sky. A minute to drink in it, sunshine, pulling out of that. Uh, thank you, students, and uh, thank you to my mentors, Carl and, and uh, Karen Sanudu. <laughs> Celine Wang, come on up. Hi, everyone. It's full of rotary barbecue time. Join us for a wonderful tradition with incredible food and fellowship on September 1st at five o'clock at the History Park. There will be no lunch meeting that day, so come grab a drink from the Shark Mobile and enjoy fabulous appetizers and uh, dinner prepared by our executive chefs and all-star service by me and my fellow Red Badgers. Don't miss out and sign up online and see you there. I'll point out that was the perfect committee update speech right there, everyone. Uh, Edwin Tan and Todd Langton, come on up. These guys are getting a blue badge today, meaning that they were also part of the COVID cohort. Let's give them both a round of applause, please. Jenny, Jenny Nicholas here? Is Jenny I am on here. Zoom? Hello, everybody. John During to introduce can today's speaker, me? do you know? Hello, can you hear me? I'm here. Anybody want to sing another song? Okay, I'm, I'm here for the people on Zoom, but I guess uh, the people in the room can't hear me. We can hear you loud and clear, Jenny. Okay. So with that, uh, Jenny Nicholas will introduce today's speaker. Go ahead, Jenny. Oh, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. It's my, it's my honor to introduce you today. today. Um, Susan, um, Susan Mayaki. Mayaki. 
I do is do from um, the history of San Jose hand count project. Um, just so you all know, they'll be speaking about the project, but let me tell you a little bit about how amazing Susan and Tom are. Susan is a longtime activist um, in the San Jose area, um, in the Japanese American community, and was a part of the grassroots movement for Japanese American redress, working um, on the, um, oh, sorry, my sound, Nihon Machi Outreach Committee and the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. And she was a performing mentor of San Jose Taiko from 1980 through 1990 and was appointed to the 1995 Civil Liberties Public Education Fund Board by President Clinton and served as, as its vice chair. Tom has been involved with the San Jose Japanese American community for many years, um, including in the grassroots movement for redress during the 1980s. He served as executive director of UI Kai Senior Center, who Um, the Japantown area, as you may know, was one of the sites of major canning operations in San Jose. He currently serves on the advisory board of the Japanese yeah. Museum of San Jose, as well as a volunteer on its public programs and grant committees. It's such an honor, Tom and Susan, to have you with us today. And so I would like to welcome them. They're on Zoom with us right now. Um, please go ahead. Thank you all. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley Rotary Club. Um, we really appreciate you allowing us to be guests today. I'd also like to share my deep gratitude to the club here and all the wonderful work you've done, as well as to Rotarians everywhere in the country and the world, because they do really important things. And I'm always very inspired by, by your organization. I am Tom Izu. And, and I'm Susan Hayase. We are volunteer co-directors of the Hidden Histories San Jose Japantown project uh, with the San Jose Japanese American Museum. Next. Oh, oh, just one second while we share the screen. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, um, could, could we share the screen? Uh, we have a couple of slides before our, we have a little video to show also. Oh, okay, there we go. Just one moment, here we go. Okay, um, many of you are, are probably familiar with San Jose Japantown neighborhood. It's a business and cultural area considered to be the heart of the city's Japanese American community. But perhaps you may not know that before Japantown, there was a Chinatown there known as Heinlandville. And that during the 1930s, it also included a vibrant Filipino community or Pinoy town. The overlapping histories of these three major API communities sharing this one neighborhood make it a very unique place with important but hidden histories about the forces that shaped our city. Next. Utilizing augmented reality art and a grant from the Knight Foundation's Immersive Technology in the Arts program, we created a grassroots community project to capture these stories by training artists and supporters to make them publicly accessible and viewable by anyone who visits the Japantown neighborhood. Augmented reality, or AR, is a mobile app technology that overlays computer-generated information, such as sounds, images, texts, on the camera view of your phone or smart device and allows you to see AR artworks placed at specific sites, such as in this case, various locations throughout Japantown. Next, we'd like to share with you a brief video of our grant funded project that began in January, 2020 and that ended in June, 2021. So hopefully this will work. I know this is kind of an experiment for all of you right now and we do appreciate being the guinea pigs, the first presenters. We, so let's, let's see if our video works.
we came up with the name Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown because it was very apparent a lot of people don't know the history of that community and that it wasn't just about Japanese American history but it involved two other communities including the Chinese Americans and Filipino Americans. Japantown where it exists now actually was established on a place that uh, Chinatown existed in San Jose before and, and not a lot of people know that. Filipinos had a very active and vibrant community also in Japantown. So it's actually a place shared by these three communities and we wanted to bring that history alive for people and get them to really think more about why Japantown is such a special place. The exciting thing was the idea that we could bring in artists to really invigorate the way that people look at our community. We felt that artistic visions of both the history of San Jose, Japantown, the relationships between the different communities, and the way the place used to look, the way people used to feel, that this would be really exciting and inspiring to our entire community and our broader community, the Chinese American, the Filipino American, as well as the Japanese American communities. We really specifically did community building with art and technology. And the what that meant in real life was people telling stories and then other people uh, helping them figure out how to tell the story in different ways. And, and that part, you know, that um, mixing of the person with the memory and people uh, with the art and people with the technology and, and brainstorming that whole process that that's community building. to promote a term that I'm coining <laughs> called uh, liberation technology. I think that um, a lot of times people talk about technology like it's, you know, outside of human experience. It's like above us. It's smarter. The technology is smarter than us. But I think that um, one of the things that we learned from Tomiko is that, you know, uh, augmented reality technology is usually used by a profit making corporation to commoditize the technology into something that's pre-packaged, um, that's produced by focus groups in order to sell it to you. And you just buy it and it's a kind of a passive process. And I want to call it liberation technology because um, this was something that, uh, you know, older community artists were able to expand their artistic horizons by learning how to use it by learning how to think in that um, and create in that context. And it was something that uh, younger uh, artists were able to uh, connect with the community without having to go work for a game, video game company you know, to get access to the technology, you know? And so, and, and I think it also allowed us to 
uh, show it to people in the community who may either fear or feel you know turned off by technology and to show them that it could really be in the service of uh, connecting people. This is Dr. Tokyo Ishikawa. I was born on Jackson Street in 1909, and I've lived in San Jose all my life. I've, in fact, I've lived in Japantown all my life. Except Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Facebook uh, live stream. So for today's live stream, it's uh, episode three of the Hidden Histories. Originally, we planned uh, the Hidden Histories project, this uh, education about history and the stories as well as the technology to take place in person. We, we were going to have community meetings. We were going to have meetings between Tommy Gothiel, uh, the uh, our artist advisor and the artists. We we're going to have hands-on uh, trainings and we we're going to have uh, uh, walking tours and events right in Japantown where all of the artists would congregate and uh, the community could see what we were doing. Yeah. But the pandemic uh, kind of blew a hole in that plan. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. And I hope everybody's been able to get to the um, AR Poise tutorial as well as the uh, AR Voss tutorial and the part of the video AR I'm going to show you how me. to import a pattern, a drawing, or a photo, and apply it to a 3D object. So we're going to so go up into here. the top panel here. Um, and I can apply on. it to um, my different objects here. So I'm going to drag it onto the plane. And now you can see it. That image is now affixed to the front of that plane. interesting way to get your history. I think we accomplished what we set out to do for the grant, and that is to experiment with immersive technology. And I think what we did do is show that augmented reality technology using art is possible to do for our small grassroots operation with uh, little resources to help explore a different way of educating the public about the history of a particular community and area and to make new connections for a museum and to open up all sorts of opportunities for the future and that it's doable. And I'm very proud that we can talk more about all of the things that kind of came together to make this possible. But, but I am proud that we were able to do this and show that other communities hopefully will be inspired to do the same thing with even small amounts of resources. But just as long as you have the right community spirit and are willing to try new things, I feel very good about what we were able to accomplish. Let's see, how do I, oh, how do I go back to the um, slideshow? 
I'm not sure how to, I guess I have to, um, I'm not really sure what to do here. Um, I'm sorry, just <laughs> one moment. I, the, the video was in, embedded in our slideshow, but for some reason, I, I don't know how to advance the slide. Oh, that, I don't want to do that. Oh, there it is. Okay, uh, let me let me share that. So, um, so our our grant program, um, our grant project ended this past June. Um, but what that means is that the the whole creating of our organization and the the teaching of the artists and the development of the artworks, um, that process has ended. But in the course of doing that, we've created a grassroots community, uh, community-based network of uh, local groups and artists and uh, many supporters who wish to continue to help us to uncover more hidden histories uh, for our community and to figure out a way to um, get those uh, turned into art and um, turned into augmented reality artworks. Um, we're going to be uh, hosting an exhibit uh, beginning this next month um, at the Japanese American Museum um, of San Jose. And we're going to uh, use that exhibit to kind of explain the process that we went through and to also give more uh, detailed information on uh, the artists and their backgrounds. And we'll also be holding um, walking tours and public programs in the near future based on the incredible wealth of historical uh, content that um, we have about the, the three uh, communities in San Jose, Japan town. Um, we've also launched, launched a sponsorship campaign to fund uh, future Hidden Histories work. Um, it also, uh, oh, how do I do that? Oh yeah. Um, includes an augmented reality donor recognition piece that will be viewable in front of the Japanese American Museum's entrance, um, featuring a chance for sponsors names to be cast into AR floating coins. So that's kind of a little uh, gimmick that we figured out. Um, let's see. So if you, if you want your name on a coin floating in augmented reality, that's a little um, premium. <laughs> So we thank you so much for your attention and for allowing us uh, to share this information on our project. Um, we have a website and um, a Facebook and a YouTube channel, and um, we'll post that in the chat also. And we would love to hear um, any uh, questions or comments or, um, about the project. So let's see. Let me uh, share the uh, oops. Share these to the uh, chat. Anybody have a question? Please come up to the microphone. And thank you, Tom and Susan, for your presentation. Don't all come up at once. Jenny, are you there? I am here, and I, I, I really most of the comments that have come so far in the chat, please, those on Zoom, feel free to um, add them in, have been comments of how beautiful it is, Susan and Tom. And so it really is, and I can imagine how much better it would be in person and wanting the links to the videos. Um, and so the first thing that I would say, um, can you talk to, um, people are saying that Japantown is such a treasure for us. I feel like that. I live in the Japantown area. Has this helped with visitation since COVID? Um, you know, it's it's really hard to say. I think that uh, you know, as as all other organizations um, have experienced, you know, we've been trying to project and figure out, you know, what at what point do we think we'd be able to have, you know, in person events, and and as things, uh, you know, progress and change, it's it's kind of been difficult. We. We did have kind of an inaugural showcase in mid June, and we um, hosted a number of people. But that was kind of at the beginning of when things started to open up before the Delta surge, you know. So um, I think people were still a little hesitant. Um, but I, I think uh, we're really lucky because um, 
it's not like an exhibit that we have to take down. It's something that can be there in perpetuity. And we feel like there's a lot of opportunities in the future as things do open up more to have things like school tours or um, just continued walking tours as to augment the, the kinds of exhibits that we have at the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. And just as a quick follow-up to that before I kick it back to Steve, if people want to come do a tour, um, how do they, can you put in the chat or, or let us know we can send out the best way for people to connect to the online? Um, that would be really great so that folks could do that walking tour if they chose to. Steve, I'll turn it back to you for any in-person. Thank you, Jenny. Rod Diridon. <clears throat> Steve uh, and Jenny, it's really Rod, nice to... Rod, would you take the mic out of the cradle and just get it a little closer to your mouth? Thank you. Is that better? Much, thanks. Okay. I, thank you, Steve, for uh, uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, folks, this is really a nice thing to see and a pride, very prideful, um, pride-worthy uh, experience for the Japanese in the, in the area. Uh, Chinese and Filipinos, as you mentioned also. <clears throat> we have one of you listening to us now, maybe watching also, from Maryland, where he is just turning 90 years old, and he's the most profound individual ever to come from this county, uh, without question. Twice. Cabinet member. His home still exists in Japantown, and uh, he is listening and watching today, as I said. So would you um, think about uh, including Norman Wymanetta, our first mayor, our first co uh, congressman of Asian descent from California, and uh, 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 is an honorary member of this Rotary Club in your display. Hi, Norm. Um, it's, I'm so honored that you're watching. Um, uh, we're just uh, so proud of all the work that you've done and, and the leadership that you've provided to our community, but also to the country. And, um, you know, uh, when Jenny introduced me, she said, mentioned that I'd been uh, active in the redress campaign for Japanese Americans. And during that campaign, uh, we worked with uh, Representative Norm Mineta's office and his staff, and, and he himself were um, just wonderful to work with because of, uh, you know, Norm's courageous leadership of that campaign and um, his deep appreciation for the grassroots community mm -hmm. organizing that was required in order to win that campaign. So, um, yes. Obviously, um, the Mineta family is a big part of the history of San Jose Japantown, and uh, we'll start working on it right away. Yeah, what, what we're hoping um, is that this, this project was an experiment to uh, actually see uh, what we can do with pretty limited resources, but there's a lot more stories uh, for this area of Japantown. Um, Japanese American, Chinese American, Filipino American, but also other groups uh, that we'd also like to explore their history and their individuals, such as Norman Mineta and, and his accomplishments. So I think there's a lot of projects that we'd like to see happen uh, in the near future. And we would be very happy to support those and help projects like that. That's kind of our wish is that other groups will want to, want to do more. Um, we are working with the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project. Um, they have the a replica of the temple that used to be where San Jose Japantown is in Heinlandville at um, History San Jose Park. And I, they're interested in doing some more pieces. There, there are some pieces about Heinlandville up now, but we, we would like to work with them to do more. The Filipino American National Historical Society, Santa Clara Valley Chapter is another group we wanna work with. They're already doing walking tours. Um, so there's a lot of room here. And we're just trying to figure out how to help support efforts like that of other organizations and any any ideas you have yourselves, we'd really love to hear. Um, one thing um, I'd like to add right now is that these, we started with Chinese and Filipino American communities in particular, because they have such a deep link to the actual origins of what we call Japantown. But there are other com communities 
uh, uh, connected deeply with Japantown too, that we'd also hope to uh, do some projects. One I'm really interested in doing is a Black Americans, African American community, because um, the area that Japantown is in historically was a de facto segregated community. And in 1937, when they were doing redlining, uh, it was it was uh, pointed out as an area that's probably not a good place to uh, invest money in because of basically too many Orientals and Negroes. And what they're referring to is the Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos who are still there, but they're also referring to uh, Black Americans. And there is a, a historic uh, community very, very close to Japantown. And I, I'd love to work more with that community to see if we can bring some of their stories to light as well. Thank you both for that. I have another question in the chat, but I, Tom and Susan, I'd love to talk with you about that offline. I think I have some folks we could connect you with. We do have a question about um, the learnings across generations through this project. Um, has there been some learning across that um, about how you've used tech in this really amazing way for storytelling and really telling this, the real history um, of the region and the neighborhood? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so um, one of the big uh, challenges um, of this project was that intergenerational aspect. And it kind of goes, in two different ways. So we have some artists who are older and who are um, very experienced community artists who have a, a deep personal history with Japantown or with the Japanese American community and the Chinese American community, um, uh, but who have like almost no technical experience with digital media arts. So that was a big challenge. But then we also had uh, some young, uh, artists who were, you know, some of them coming off of um, arts programs at San Jose State in digital media arts. So their skills were at a very high level, but they didn't know that much about our local community. And then we had all these people in between. So, um, um, you know, I think that um, people smarter than us probably would have said, you know, this is too hard of a problem. <laughs> and, um, you know, just pick one of those. But we, since we didn't really know, we decided to do, uh, tackle it all at once. And so one of the things that we did, and partly this was inspired by the, or necessitated by the pandemic, um, we have uh, one of our staff members is a, a incredible uh, historic, local historian. His name is Kurt Fukuda, and he's been doing oral histories and taking photos of all different activities in the Japantown area of all the different uh, ethnic communities for like the last 30 or 40 years. So he's got an incredible treasure trove. He also was one of the authors of the Japantown book, which is, you know, weighs like 20 pounds. It's just a gigantic resource on the history of the people in the place. So um, what we did first was we he, he wrote up a kind of a truncated history of uh, Japantown and all the artists read it. And then we started having workshops where he would show different uh, of his historical recordings of uh, uh, oral history interviews of the different groups to really start to acclimate um, all of the artists to the, the richness of the stories and the, um, you know, to, to get them away from doing like history lessons to telling the story of the, the neighborhood and the communities via these personal remembrances and symbolic kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, symbols of the, the way the life was in the history of Japantown, so. And yeah, so, so the um, intergenerational nature of this project was something really, I think, really important and something that um, I think uh, we were successful in doing, even though we may not have understood how to do it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But some of the advisors we have <clears throat> have very uh, deep personal stories about growing up in that area, going all the way back to the 1930s or their parents or grandparents were in Highlandville, Chinatown, for example. And these, these stories we realized are some of the most inspiring and moving of the things we did in our project to the artists, <clears throat> excuse me, regardless of their age, uh, but especially the young people, it gave them much better idea of as artists, how, how to kind of un unleash their creativity and coming up with an augmented reality piece. Um, so the, this intergenerational aspect is really, really important in, um, in any kind of work uh, to do education about the community because it, it shows there's this continuum uh, from way back to the present 
and these very inspiring stories that help give us this, give people a sense of, of any age that a, a place to belong and be connected to. So, um, you know, that, that was a really, really important part of, uh, and most meaningful part of uh, this project, I think, is that what the question, the question that's being asked. Thank I'll you. say thank you to Susan and Tom. We have no more questions in the room. And so uh, we had talked about staying over, but since there are no questions, Tom and Susan, I want to say thank you. Uh, a donation in your name will be made to San Jose Tyco. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. And next week we have Craig Clements speaking about a very timely topic, which is wildfire science. And with that, thank you all for indulging me and Carl and Karen today and have a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you so much.